So this morning, we want to take a look at this marvelous passage, and we're asking the question, who is in control? And we have a, a few scenes here with Paul and Silas, and it starts out happy, but it ends up sad, but then it gets happy, which is kind of how life works. There, there's these different scenes that we go through, and sometimes we wonder, who is in control? This is... Paul is actually doing a series of mission trips. This is his second big mission trip that he's doing. And his first trip was awesome, except that his right-hand man went AWOL. And so this second trip, he, he split up with his, tra with his partner because they were, they were fighting over whether or not to forgive the guy or not, whether they, he could be trusted for, the, for this second mission or not. People don't always agree on decisions, do we? And God, God can work through that too. So we see Paul, he's heading over to Europe. He's actually seen a vision in the middle of the night of a man saying, come over to Macedonia, to Europe, help us, tell us about Jesus. And so he goes there and it starts out awesome. It looks like in the first week or two that a woman decides she wants to follow Jesus and everything is going great. You, you could say that she's on a roll. Everything is just perfect. There's one convert already and then there's this girl following them who is possessed by a demon. And we read the girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. It's almost like she's preaching for him except there's something about her is so annoying, Paul finally gets angry with, with the way she's doing this. And Paul says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And he sets her free. This is an incredible campaign that's going on. And I don't know about you, but it, when things are going really good in school or good at work, do you ever feel like patting yourself on the back? Or sometimes people put their shoulder out of joint by patting themselves on the back a little bit too hard. If you go back to the Old Testament, you get to King Saul, and we read that Saul was on a military campaign, and it was awesome. He was, he was fantastic. So the prophet Samuel, we read in 1 Samuel 15, if we, a bunch of us are reading a, a passage in the Bible every day, a chapter a day from the Bible. So if you're doing that with us, you, you read this this last week. If not, you're welcome to jump in any time. It's in the newsletter. But we read that Samuel got up early in the morning, and he goes to find King Saul, and he's not there. He's not with the army. And so he says, where's King Saul? And they say, well, King Saul went to build a monument to himself. Don't build monuments to yourself. That, that is... It, even sometimes we, we feel like we're just doing so great, but it's still God who's in control, isn't he? he? He gives us talent. We work hard. Sometimes we make really wise decisions with God's help. We just forget that part of it sometimes. That God is still the one in control. So I hope you're on a roll. I, I hope that things are going great in work and in your relationships and financially and health-wise. But at some point, something trips up, doesn't it? Something knocks us down. And we read, the magistrates ordered Paul and Barnabas to be stripped and beaten. The owners of this slave girl, they're mad because they made a lot of money off her. And so they're not happy that she's been set free. They say, we got to get rid of these guys. And so they have them arrested under false pretenses. And Paul and Barnabas are thrown in jail for doing good, not because they've done anything bad. And, you know, I've walked into a jail to play volleyball. And I've walked into a jail to visit people, but I've never walked into a jail stripped and beaten, severely flogged, feet in stocks, in an inner cell. This is actually a picture of a jail cell in Philippi. 
We don't know for sure if this is the jail where, where Paul was, but could have been. Just a you know, cramped little place, pretty dank. If it's an inner cell, who knows what kind of vermin are there. Did Paul deserve this? No. But if, sometimes we get knocked in a hole, don't we? Sometimes we, we go from riding on top of everything and to just getting knocked down pretty hard. Back in the Soviet Union, if you turn the clock back just over 30 years to 1989, there was a young communist in Romania. His name was Mircea, and he became a Christian. And that got him into trouble. In 1989, the Securitate, the secret police, arrested him. They bound his hands behind his back and made him lie on the floor on his stomach. They beat him mercilessly with a hard rubber truncheon on the soles of his feet. Several times that no, dreary November night, they kept coming back for him. At midnight, they released him. It took him three hours to crawl home on his hands and knees across the city. The following day, they arrested Mircea again. And the officer in charge kicked him in the back, slamming him into the wall, told him, go, you garbage, in three months you will be no more. Your wife will go to another man, your children will be on the streets, then you will know that in this country there is no God but the secret police. He didn't deserve that. And we live in a broken, sinful world. And I would like to tell you, if you follow Jesus, everything's going to go perfect all the time. But there, that's not the way life works every day. But Jesus does come in, and he will fight on your behalf. He says he's the good shepherd. And in the middle of a moment like this, you are under pressure. And what is really inside is going to come out. And Paul and Silas are in this jail cell. And can you imagine how sore you would be if you had been stripped beaten, flogged, put in a dank cell, feet in the stocks. Is that the time you decide to do karaoke? <laughs> Silas, let's sing. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing the blues. Not exactly. They're singing hymns to God. What did they have to be thankful for? Well, they're still alive, but the, the, God is still good. Even when my circumstances turn negative, even the, when it doesn't make sense, God is still good, and he has not forgotten me, and he's not forgotten you. And we read that suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. It's a miracle, isn't it? That's what it is. Because God is not out of options, ever, ever. Mircea, that Romanian Christian, he said, the author tells us about him, the Securitate did not know that in six weeks, in the latter half of December 1989, communism would fall and the secret police would be no more. Some of you may have seen video of the, the Berlin Wall being taken down by sledgehammers and freedom coming in where there had been terrible communist rule for 60 years. And this terrible, br brutal officer that had tortured Mircea was brought into court. And on the witness stand, Mircea reminded the colonel that he had said that the only God in Romania is the secret police. And he asked the colonel, who is God in Romania? And the colonel said, God is the God of Romania. The prosecutor of the case asked Mircea to plead with the judge for the strongest possible sentence against this man. Mircea declined. He told the judge, I preach forgiveness from Scripture. And if I do not live it in my life, then my preaching 
is worthless. The judge sternly addressed the colonel, you should take off Mercea's shoes and kiss the soles of his feet that you beat. I wanted to condemn you for seven years, but this man forgives you. I don't know where you are this morning, but Rebecca Manley Pippert said something that comes back to me now and again. She said, if God is not the God of my darkest hour, then he is not God at all. But God is the God of my darkest hour. God is with you when you're on a roll. He's with you when you're in the hole. What is he like? Well, we read in Psalm 113 that he raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. And so th this morning I'm going to do something just a little odd. I'm going to let Johnny Cash do a little bit of the preaching this morning. If I could sing like Johnny Cash, I'd, I'd sing a few things, but I I'll spare you that. Um, I didn't know. He was not born Johnny Cash. He was born J.R. Cash. And when he was just five years old, he was working cotton fields. He was from a poor family. He was given a guitar at age 12. He joined the military. And they said, well, you have to have a first name. We have to put one on, the, on this, this form. So he called himself Johnny. And it worked. He was... In the Air Force, he was intercepting Soviet Morse code during the Korean War. He formed his first band while he was in the Air Force, the Barbarians. And he was in California, and he started a fire accidentally. Well, he started a fire on purpose, but it got a little out of control, and he burned up a chunk of the Los Padres National Forest and scared off dozens of condors and got sued by the federal government. He was nobody then. But in the 1960s, they took a survey of the most recognizable men in the world. Number one was the Pope. Number two was the U.S. president. And number three was Johnny Cash. <laughs> one place ahead of Billy Graham, the evangelist. So how tough is this great man? We read he was frightened before every concert, thinking he was on the verge of failure. How famous was he? There was a civil war going on in Northern Ireland, but he offered to come sing, and they called a truce. And he came in a church, and the fighters from one side sat on one side, and the fighters from the other side sat on the other side, and they all listened to Johnny Cash in peace for a little while, in Belfast. He was the oldest artist ever nominated for an MTV Video Music Award. Justin Timberlake won an award that year, and he said in his acceptance speech, this is a travesty. I demand a recount. My grandfather raised me on Johnny Cash, and I think he deserves this more than any of us in here tonight. And Cash did a video called God's Gonna Cut You Down, and if you look at it on YouTube, it has Justin Timberlake, it has Johnny Depp, it has a bunch of A-listers, singing along with lyrics like these, as sure as God made the day and the night, what you do in the dark will be brought to the light. You may run on for a long time, run on for a long time. You may run on for a long time, but let me tell you, God Almighty's going to cut you down. We know there's judgment. We all know there's judgment, that God is holy and we are not. Cash sang a song called Hurt. He sang, you could have it all, my empire of dirt. I will let you down and I will make you hurt. I wear this crown of thorns upon my liar's chair, full of broken thoughts I cannot repair. He knew he was a sinner. In 1967, in October, he decided to end his life. He went to the mouth of a cave on the Tennessee River, where in the past he had looked for arrowheads and Civil War artifacts. It's called Nickajack Cave, and it's a deep system with twists and turns and side chambers and cliffs. So he took his flashlight and he went in, and he decided to go farther and farther in until his batteries die and then lie down one last time. 
And he crawled deeper and deeper, hour after hour, into this complex labyrinth. And finally, the flashlight went out, and he lay down in the darkness. He said, I was as far from God as I have ever been. My separation from him, the deepest and most ravaging of the various kinds of loneliness I'd felt over the years, seemed finally complete. That's where sin will take us. The good news is that we don't have to stay there. Oh, I forgot to show that beautiful picture. Yeah? That is not a posed picture on the right. That, that was not a picture he wanted taken. Uh, that's, he, he earned that. But what else do we read in Acts 16? The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. The jailer asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And Paul and Silas went home with him and his whole family was baptized that night into the name of the Lord Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Cash had felt like I, he was as far from God as he had ever been, but then he says, it wasn't. I thought I'd left God, but he hadn't left me. I felt something very powerful start to happen to me and a sense of utter peace and sobriety. And there in Nickajack Cave, I became conscious of a very clear, simple idea. I was not in charge of my own destiny. I was not in charge of my own death. Johnny Cash began crawling in whatever direction seemed right, total darkness, he had to feel with his hands, crawling like a crab, lest he fall over a precipice. And after a long time, he felt a little gentle breath of wind. And he knew that with that movement of air, there must be a way out. He followed the wind until he saw the light and emerged, but he didn't emerge alone. There at the mouth of his cave was his mother. That's what moms are like often, aren't they? And a good friend waiting by his abandoned Jeep. And Johnny Cash, in addition to songs like Hurt and Ring of Fire and all any other songs you like, he also wrote, God called my name in a voice so sweet, I thought I heard the shuffle of angels' feet. He called my name and my heart stood still when he said, John, go do my will. God has a destiny for each of us. People he wants us to talk to. He wrote another great song, The Man Comes Around. He said there's a man going around taking names, and he decides who to free and who to blame. Everyone won't be treated all the same. There'll be a golden ladder reaching down when the man comes around. Talking about judgment day, isn't he? The hairs on your arm will stand up, but the terror in each sip and in each sup. Will you partake of that last, that last offered cup or disappear into the potter's ground when the man comes around? Hear the trumpets, hear the pipers, 100 million angels singing. Multitudes are marching to the big kettle drum. Voices calling, voices crying. Some are born and some are dying. It's Alpha and Omega's kingdom come. And the whirlwind is in the thorn tree. The virgins are all trimming their wicks. The whirlwind is in the thorn tree. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And the father hen, that's a little confusing. The father hen, it's poetry. You can say what you want. And the father hen will call his chickens home. The wise men will bow down before the throne, and at his feet they'll cast their cold golden crowns when the man comes around. Maybe Johnny Cash is a better preacher than I am. What else does he say? Let me quote one last little bit. He says, between heaven, this is a song called Redemption. 
He sang, between heaven and hell, a teardrop fell. In the deep crimson dew, the tree of life grew, and the blood gave life to the branches of the tree. And the blood was the price that set captives free. And the numbers that came through the fire and the flood clung to the tree and were redeemed by the blood. He's pointing us to the cross. He's saying, when I was the, one of the most recognizable man, men in the world, I was nothing. Money did nothing. But then he found Jesus. And Jesus is here for you and for me this morning, and he invites us to receive that forgiveness. We've, we've stumbled this week, and it's a good morning to say, Jesus, I still love you. Jesus, take me in. I believe you died for me and rose again. Be the leader in my life. Amen.